Good evening, everyone. Um, I am Dolores Donnelly, Community Development Officer with Armagh City, Banbridge and Craigavon Borough Council. I'd like to welcome you all to tonight, um, our third week of the lecture series, Rippling Effects of the Great Irish Famine. Um, this evening, we will have three speakers. Um, I'd also like to mention that Dr. Jared McTasney is also present um, and he'll be joining in the conversation throughout the evening. Um, the lecture has been recorded and will be available on Council's YouTube at a later date. So our first speaker is Ashme Erkia. Um, Ashme is a writer, researcher and human rights activist currently finalizing their PhD on ecofeminism. It is through this research they note the importance to look at environmental strategies such as famines through a different lens in order to determine the impacts of such calamities on women. So I'd like to invite Ashme to commence their talk. Um, if you'd like to unmute Ashme, and if you have a presentation, you're more than welcome to share it now as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dolores, and thanks everybody for joining today's talk. Uh, my name is Esma, and I'm a PhD researcher at Mary Immaculate College in Limerick, currently based in Dublin, and I am Moroccan as well. So today I'm actually going to look at the impacts. I'm going to try to summarize it as briefly as I can of the great hunger from a gendered perspective. So before I start, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Brilliant. All right. So uh, the title of my presentation today is simple. It's women during the great hunger. Uh, during my master's, as well as my PhD, I have had the opportunity to read a bunch of literature on what happened during basically the 1840s in Ireland as well as outside of Ireland to mostly Irish women and vulnerable uh, people during the calamity. So the things that I'm going to look at in this presentation are uh, the great hunger agenda of calamity. So I'm not assuming that everybody who joined has an idea of like the gender imbalance impact of the uh, great hunger. So I'm going to have like a brief overview. overview. Then I'm going to look at Catholic, Catholic obliviousness and women during the 1840s. Then I'm going to touch base on a few topics that can be sensitive, but I thought were important uh, topics that are underrepresented in the Great Hunger, which is human trafficking. I'm going to look at the Earl Grey scheme, uh, which basically was involved in the human trafficking of teenage uh, underage Irish girls, prostitution during the 1840s, and last but not least, survivor cannibalism, the unspoken horror. Okay. So the Irish government banned evictions and froze rent prices as a response to the 2020 COVID-19 outbreak. A lockdown has been put in place from March 2020 and then later on multiple times, um, basically to lower the number of deaths and the contaminations. Yet the news and, uh, and the Food Safety Authority in Ireland have been reassuring everybody that food supplies will continue, that shops will be restocked every day. And schools will continue with their school meals program to provide for the thousands of vulnerable children who need the meals. According to Central Statistics Office Ireland in 2016, 81.7% of healthcare and social workers are women. In times of a pandemic, the country is highly dependent on the sacrifices made by these women to care for the rocketing number of infected patients and the elderly. Employment of nurses and healthcare workers is ongoing and the Irish government is offering a pandemic unemployment payment for different nurses at that time. But unfortunately, a couple of centuries ago, Ireland did not have a government that served the interests of its people to the extent the way the current one does. Under British colonization, the spread of a potato blight, an unfair distribution of resources, and an unjust housing system led to what can fairly be called a genocide. The atrocities of over a decade of starvation have been since documented and can be read through history and fiction writing. Ever since the country commemorated the 150th anniversary of the first appearance of the blight in 1995, a sudden interest in famine studies emerged, resulting in research projects, conferences, essays, articles, building of memorials, and many more. Considering that most of famine academicians and historians were males, Little to no interest has been developed to study the role of women during the famine. 
Not enough scholarship has been dedicated to studying women during the Great Hunger, not only as victims, but as fighters, carers, petitioners, activists, writers, and storytellers. Before addressing the status of women during the calamity, it is important to understand its background as well as some of its politics. Margaret Kelleher, which I hope you're familiar with her work. She's amazing. Like the books she wrote and the articles on women and the great hunger are fascinating. She's the author of the feminization of famine, expressions of the inexpressible, is one of the few scholars who investigated the Irish famine through fictional and non-fictional texts. She applied the feminist analysis and provided new views on the famine discourse. So when it comes to stories uh, told about the 19th century calamity and its narratives, women who either suffered from evictions, starvation, and diseases need to be given more attention. And that's why I'm going to try to do in this presentation. So if you're familiar with women, particularly in the Great Hunger, you might be familiar with Bridget O'Donnell, the one in the picture uh, in the slide. Her picture is often used in books and exhibitions about the Great Hunger. O'Donnell was a poor Irish woman who was evicted during winter time from her house along with children because she was unable to pay the rent. Her tragedy lies in the miscarriage that she had one week after the eviction. And worst part of her story is the death of one of her children due to malnutrition. The harsh weather conditions, the shortage of food, and the lack of medical care made Bridget the victim of merciless circumstances. Eight days later, her child was born dead. Another of her children, a 13-year-old boy, died from hunger during the weeks that she laid sick. She had nothing for her remaining children to eat, a supply of corn and oats having been taken away and sold by the landlord's men. So women received no support at all when it came to their children and died due to starvation. And the stories that I'm going to cover are actually not the mainstream ones that you might find when you Google women in the great hunger, but we're gonna dig a little bit, dig a little deeper into that. So when you hear this subsection, Catholicism, a Catholic obliviousness, I'm actually going to look at women not only as victim, but sometimes as unconscious contributors to uh, the tragedy. So Catholicism has long been an integral part of Irish identity. St. Patrick and other saints arrived in Ireland in the fifth century and converted the island to Christianity. Five centuries later, internal reforms occurred and by the 12th century, leading Ireland's religious practices to become more aligned with the Roman church. The integration of the Catholic practice was accelerated with the arrival of the Anglo-Normans later on that century. Although being conquered by the Anglo-Normans, the Catholic identity in Ireland was not threatened until Henry VIII decided to declare himself the head of the Church of England. English kings wanted Ireland to conform to the English church, but the Irish kept identifying with the Catholic faith and resisted the subjugation of their religious practices. Holding on to Catholicism for centuries has directly and indirectly worsened the impacts of the great hunger on the Irish people. As a colony governed under British rule, Ireland was not an, in an ideal place for anyone that did not renounce Catholicism. Way before the mid 19th century, Catholics were prohibited from purchasing or leasing land, voting, holding political offices, or getting an education. In other words, this subjugation was meant to prevent the Irish Catholics from contributing or being part of society. In the midst of the 1840s chaos, the Gestapo Catholic Church kept enforcing moral policing even during the country's most vulnerable decade. What collides with logic is the growth of the Catholic Church during the 19th century. In the article, The Recruitment of Ident and Identity of Irish Women in the International Mission by Deidre Raftery, she writes uh, particularly about recruitment of Irish women by the Catholic Church. Raftery points out in her article that the speed of the religious growth in Ireland during the 19th century- Ashma, well Ashma, Ashma, apologies, sorry, interrupting you. Could you possibly try maybe try to speak a little bit slower? I'm sorry. Is that okay? Ashma? No worries at all. I'm just trying yeah. to keep all in time, but- yeah, don't worry about time. Don't worry about the time. All right. If you can, don't worry. If don't worry about that. You try and maybe sleep a little bit slower. Don't worry about the time. We'll be fine. Um, thank you so much. Sure. Thanks, Dolores. So Raftery points out in her article the speed of the religious growth in Ireland during the 19th century, as while there were approximately 122 nuns in Ireland in 1800, by 1901 there were 8,031. It is understandable that in times of distress, starvation, and mass evictions, 
people are most in need in something to believe in, in something that unites them and gives them hope for survival. Yet one may wonder what would have actually happened had the church focused less on sending thousands of nuns to expand Catholicism and spent more resources on helping the Irish. The Society of the Sacred Heart, for instance, was established in France in 1800 and arrived in Ireland around 1853 and was successful in attracting girls to its schools and young women to its novitiates. The Institute of the Blessed Virgin Mary's Irish branch, known as the Sisters of Loretto, was founded in 1822 by Francis Ball, who later on took the name Mary Teresa. Francis Mary Teresa was born into a wealthy family and was sent at the age of nine to receive an education in England at the Bar Convent in York. Ball's accomplishments are quite remarkable. In 1822, she opened the first institution of the order in Ireland. Her sister, the Irish philanthropist Anna Maria Ball, helped her with the development of her schools and with providing funding to the purchase of the Loretto School on St. Stephen's Green. Mother Mary Teresa's devotion to expand the convent schools all over Ireland and later on in India in 1842, Mauritius in 1844, Gibraltar in 1845, Canada in 1847, and England in 1851 is impeccable. Yet perhaps coming from a wealthy family was the reason behind her obliviousness to the Irish people's priorities. While people were dying of food deficiency, whatever funding that supported these expansions could have been used to feed the starving Irish in the most affected areas in the country. Nevertheless, it seems that devoting one's soul to serving the Catholic Church was more important. The welcoming of Irish women by the Catholic institutions was conditioned as in order for them to dedicate their lives to serving, they had to be nuns, thus abstain from natural human needs such as sex. Women who belonged to the church had the privilege not only of surviving the famine, but of continuing to live life, business as usual, as if the country's population is not rapidly disappearing. Mother Teresa Dees of the Institute of the Blessed Virgin Mary was sent by Mother Teresa Ball to Toronto in 1847. By 1851, she was Superior General in Canada. 1847 was the peak of the Great Hunger's horror. Yet some Irish nuns dedicated funding to send others overseas and make sure they climbed a Catholic hierarchy that they wanted to. This is in fact a direct discrimination against all women who either willingly or forcibly were not able to join the church and serve as nuns. Incest victims, for an example, who ended up in workhouses, women who ended up in the streets prostituting for a living, and mothers who were abandoned by their husbands in the middle of a crisis. Although the Irish Loretto sisters or other nuns during that time were are to be admired for their skills, fierceness, and activism, to what extent was their cause just and helpful? So moving on from a brief insight into women who had the privilege to join the Catholic Church and how they ignored other women who were not deemed fit to join this elite status, I am going to shed the light on more serious matters and matters that are also underrepresented in the great hunger narratives, the trafficking of Irish teenage girls. Although the debate will always be and will always remain whether the great hunger was in fact a natural disaster or an act of genocide from the British government for failing to provide adequate relief, archives and history provide abundant proof that it was in fact an ethnic cleansing and an abuse of human rights on different levels. One of the most savage violations of human rights in Irish history is the trafficking of Irish teenage orphan girls from Ireland to Australia. Between 1849 to 1851, more than 4,000 Irish girls were shipped to Australia from workhouses across Ireland and were sent to mostly Sydney, Port Phillip, and Adelaide. Veronique Molinari wrote that immigration was perceived as a way to simultaneously relieve pressure on the overflowing Irish workhouses at home, 
help redress the gender imbalance in Australia and address the labor shortage in the colony. The term immigration gives the impression of somewhat having a choice in one's displacement. Yet this has not been the case for the Irish teenage girls who were not even old enough to make decisions such as crossing oceans and settling in another continent. The term immigration, as described by many writers like Joseph Robbins in his 1968 article, Irish Orphan Immigration to Australia, 1848-1850, is not an accurate description of the journey to Australia that thousands of underage Irish girls had to take. The scheme was enacted by Henry, the third Earl Grey, who worked as Secretary of the State for the colonies between 1846 and 1852. The scheme was politically supported by Britain because it reduced the rates payable to poor law unions as it was easier and cost-effective to ship the girls away, contributing greatly to the concealed and denied ethnic cleansing by the British government. The Australian government had strict eligibility criteria for who can join the scheme. The girls had to be, and I quote, imbued with religion and morally pure, meaning they had to be virgins, obedient, and ready to serve as wives to the men they were about to marry. In the 21st century, this would be the definition of human trafficking for sexual exploitation. What seems to be a relief program from Australia and what some might consider as a support from the Australian government was in fact an exploitation of the young girls' bodies to serve a heteronormative society's reproduction goals. The girls were referred to as breeders, a term that commodifies their genitals and their reproductive abilities. Young marriageable women were also needed to, be, to bring a stabilizing moral influence to rough masculine colonial societies. And this last sentence was a quote from Molinari's 2018 publication. So in 1848, 110 orphan girls were also sent from the Skibbereen Union Workhouse, the Skibbereen Community Hospital Campus, where it was estimated that around 60 people died per day due to hunger and disease. Thomas McCollum, an Irish artist in residence in Skibbereen's Lothgate Hub, worked on a series of 110 bronze spoons, which is uh, depicted in the image in the slide, each representing one of the 110 Skibbereen girls. Her artwork, 110 Skibbereen girls, was a result of her work with the Skibbereen Community Hospital campus staff, service users, residents, and visitors to develop a permanent site, specific artwork on the campus ground. Earl Grey's sexist and pedophilic plan aimed at hitting two birds with one stone relieving the crowd of the Irish workhouses and supplying female labor and bodies to Australia. Sending underage girls on months long journeys across the world, accompanied with men leaving the ships has resulted in what was inevitable traumatic onboard and post arrival experiences. To quote from Molinari's publication again, as it was various cases of abuses were reported. The first and second mates, as well as some other officers on the Earl Grey, were accused of having paid improper attentions to the young girls on board, and the crew of having had unrestricted intercourse with them. The officers and seamen on board, the James Gibbon 1849, were reportedly guilty of similar conduct, and six of the females who sailed to Port Phillip on the Manchester were said to have been hired by brothel keepers the moment they arrived on board. Again, the surgeons of the Waverley, of the Lysander and the Thomas Arnott were accused of having threatened unmarried females improperly. This scheme has everlasting impacts on the girls and their descendants. Some describe the female orphan survivors as women who flourished. By flourished, they mean married and had children from the men they most likely had no choice but to marry. Forced marriages, lack or absence of contraception, and unreported domestic abuse is thus what the Irish girls were given as flourishing. Yet not all girls were lucky enough to flourish. From suicide stories to being admitted to mental asylums, 
not Irish, all Irish girls had a safe journey. Some orphans suffered exploitation and abuse from unscrupulous employers, and many fell on hard times. All were subjected to rampant discrimination as anti-Irish sentiment grew with the arrival of each ship. And what is worse in the eyes of God, filial cannibalism or prostitution? And aren't they both supposed to be forgiven in famine conditions in the eyes of the Catholic Church? According to John Mitchell in his last conquest of Ireland, some women who were starving began to aid their own children in order to survive. Yet to what extent is this accurate? Were they really insane? Or was it just their instinctual reaction to a fatal catastrophe, their way of survival? No wonder that the number of prostitutes increased dramatically during the 19th century. The only reliable figures where the exact number of arrests are registered are the police statistics. Yet these are not quite reliable since the records only show first arrests without any further records of the, uh, of the arrests that followed, considering that a woman was arrested multiple times a year for soliciting. Records show the hundreds of Riddells, as well as dominated Dublin, as well as the hundreds of prostitutes that worked in them during the mid 19th century. The increase of prostitution led to ine the inevitable result of sexually transmitted diseases. This was the main reason of the appearance of the CDAs, the Contagious Diseases Act, in 1864, an aftermath of the Great Hunger. Due to the large number of gonorrhea and syphilis infections, the government feared that an epidemic would actually affect the performance of the army, since soldiers were the ones uh, to go to brothels frequently. Women in prostitution did not suffer from the lack of healthcare only, but were victims of violence as well. As sex workers, they were forced to engage in sexual acts against their wills, and sometimes they went to court to seek justice. Mary Flanagan, for instance, an exceedingly juvenile Cyprian, appeared before the courts in Ennis in October in 1845. She alleged that a client, Francis Kelly, had incised her into a field and raped her at knife point. Kelly was later acquitted when Flanagan could not identify him. Mary Ludy wrote significantly about prostitution during the 19th century in Ireland. In her book, Women and Philanthropy in 19th Century Ireland, Ludy dedicated chapter four, Prostitution and Rescue Work, to discussing prostitution and sexual morality and the responses that emerged from the government and society. Ludy writes that one impressionistic account of prostitution in Irish cities from the earlier part of the century comes from evidence gathered by William Logan, a mission worker from Leeds who also engaged in rescue work on a trip he made in 1845. From a philanthropic gentleman, he ascertained that Cork contained 85 regular brothels and 356 public prostitutes. Logan noted that in Cork, a large number of procuresses abound. Individuals have been known to tender their daughters and other relatives to brothel keepers for money. A man in 1841 voluntarily offered his daughter for three pounds. In addition to these women, there were thought to be 100 privateers who operated from houses not designated as brothels. After her 18, uh, 1995 book, Lydia's interest in Irish women's sex work continued. She wrote Abandoned Women and Bad Characters, Prostitution in 19th Century Ireland, which was published by Women's History Review in 2006, where she examined again the extent of prostitution in 19th century Ireland. Ludi wrote in this piece that prostitution existed in public and in private, and that for women, it was either a daily way of life, while to others, it was occasional, and acknowledged that it is difficult to provide accurate numbers of prostitutes in Ireland in any given period of time. Yet not all prostitutes were in, were in it equally, as there were a class and social gap among them, creating a hierarchy and a class structure. 
It is important to note that sex workers alongside the counter and institutions that were established to fight sex work were strongly present in Ireland before the Great Hunger, as a large number of them were prostituting while working at the workhouses. Irish authorities, according to Ludi, were not hard on making arrests, but would once in a while make efforts to clear the streets of prostitutes. Apparently, the police in the mid-19th century had legal codes of what a prostitute is. The 1847 Police Clause Act defined a prostitute as a night walker loitering or importing passengers for the purpose of prostitution. This act changed in 1854, describing women as offensive. A decade later, areas in the south of the country was, were labeled as subjected areas. Ludi wrote that compulsory and arbitrary inspections were conducted on women to check if they had any sexually transmitted diseases. If a woman was found infected, she would be held in a lock hospital for up to nine months and would be registered as a prostitute. The problematic with these violations acts is that inspections and forced medical examinations were targeting women only, whereas men were kept out of these acts. Registering someone as a prostitute at that time was perhaps the equivalent of registering somebody as a sex offender, which means more segregation in society than they were already facing. Another subject when I did some research on prostitution was how Irish women carried prostitution as a survival mechanism even after they migrated. And prostitution in Montreal, for an example, is another angle that is not often spoken about in Irish famine narratives. Survival mechanisms that many Irish women opted for for, sur for survival followed them to North America. The early 1840s are the years where Irish immigrant women exercised sex work and were stigmatized as streetwalkers in the city of Montreal. And with the great and with the arrival of the Great Hunger, the numbers kept increasing. Thus, the nuns' rules in Montreal was not limited to helping the famine migrants, but also establishing institutions to save what kind described in these writings as the destitute, destitute female immigrants. So now we're going to approach a topic that's actually gave me the chills every time I try to write about or read about, which is survival cannibalism. So when we approach the topic of cannibalism during the Great Hunger, it is important to give credit to Cormac Ograda as the researcher who dug deep into the topic. The graphic nature of cannibalism itself may have prevented proper research on forced cannibalism during the mid 19th century Ireland. In her book, The Great Irish, uh, the Great Irish Famine, Impact, Ideology and Rebellion, Christine Kinelli acknowledges that there has been a reluctance in academia to engage with the darkest sides of the great hunger, such as suicide, prostitution, and cannibalism. Yet the Irish pioneer in famine studies, Cormac Ograda, did not hesitate to research cannibalism as a dark secret that lingers in the history of Irish famines. Ograda wrote the book, Eating People is Wrong, and other essays on famine. It is its past and its future. Throughout his thought-provoking book, Ograda brought new perspectives on famines from the 17th until the 21st century with a focus on famine cannibalism. Although he mainly focused on two major famines, the Great Bengal Famine and the Chinese, uh, Chinese Great Leap Forward Famine, the author had a few arguments about Ireland, its famines and hunger cannibalism. Firstly, he makes it clear to the reader that was, is discussed in hunger cannibalism and it's not a ritual human sacrifice. According to Ograda, the earliest recorded famine cannibalism dates back to the 7th century, where famine and disease raged for three years in Ireland so that man ate man. Ograda continues with mentioning other recordings of famine cannibalism in Ireland, such as in the mid 13, uh, 1310s and then 1580s and the mid 17th century. Yet the 1840s famine is the one that raises the question on whether there is enough evidence of human meat consumption during the crisis. 
Humans' instinct of sur survival brings out the worst in people when they are in desperate situations. In the BBC podcast, The Great Irish Famine, Melvin Bragg interviewed Cormac O'Grada, Neve Gallagher, and Edna Delaney. In the middle of the interview, Cormac O'Grada brings up the subject of famine cannibalism and calls it survival cannibalism. As people do not kill each other, but try to live off others' cadavers after they had already died. People in the west of Ireland had it the worst, especially in Clifton, Connemara. The Great Hunger affected the region so badly that the Clifton Poor Law Union, which was formed the 24th of August, 1840, had become bankrupt. The Clifton Workhouse admitted its first paupers in 1845, who officially moved in in 1847. In 1848, the union became officially bankrupt. The Irish examiner had a story about a starving man who extracted the heart and liver of a corpse that was by the shore. In 1848, a man named John Connolly pleaded guilty of stealing a sheep, but was instantly discharged. After another man stood up to explain the hardship and suffering of Connolly and told the court about John Connolly's wife, and how she ended up, out of hunger, eating their dead child's legs and feet. The horrifying story was disturbing enough to revoke the three months jail time that was the initial sentence of Connolly. Yet the piece in the Irish Examiner does not mention any intervention by the law to help the starving family or to protect the other children that were still alive. It is understandable and justifiable why Irish history does not have any cannibalism records in the 19th century famine, despite that it does when it comes to earlier ones. Perhaps the fact that the Great Hunger is still recent and its trauma is still lingering, that researching cannibalism is not only sensitive, but may come across as inhumane. RTE has released a two art series entitled The Hunger, The Story of the Irish Famine, where Liam Neeson narrates the documentary, which marks the 175th anniversary of the Great Hunger. In the second episode of the documentary, cannibalism is mentioned by Cormac O'Grada, who said that if you don't understand that this happened or could happen, then you don't really understand what famine is about. And that's how I chose to conclude my presentation. Uh, these are some of the references that I used for every fact that I included, including dates, numbers, publications, as well as facts. And I guess that is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for your time. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Ashme, thank you so much. That was excellent. Um, and just so everybody will know, I will actually ask Ashme, could you maybe forward me your presentation or that certainly a list of your references and I'll circulate that to those who um, have registered for the series. Um, George, Ian, do you guys have any questions at all um, while I just look through the chat? Uh, not at the moment. There's a question yeah, here. I, uh, yeah, I, sorry, I George. Wondered, I thought it was, it was a fascinating talk and, and great insight on different perspectives and as somebody who spent years researching it it certainly uh it challenges any perception and i i've i've written on women uh during the great hunger especially in relation to county leitrim and looking at the 1830s where you're looking at cases of infanticide um where it's always the woman who's left uh, the woman is, is the one who's being searched for by the police and there's reference to uh trying to find the, the quote unquote the unnatural mother of a child that was found dead uh and they should have been killed either because they uh, born out of wedlock or they, the family was too poor uh, to keep a, another child uh, and there's also then uh, and Ashma made reference to rape cases where inevitably the perpetrator is found not guilty and there's one case in Leitrim where the girl got up to give evidence against the fella that she was she was living in the house as, as a maid basically and um, the barrister the defence bar uh, barrister ridiculed her uh, to the extent that another girl was going to give evidence against another fella and she just said i'm not going to go through that um so the records are there in, in relation to rape cases and fantasy prostitution in the workhouses uh you do find that there's there's a moral aspect to the workhouse segregation for example edward senior one of the poor law inspectors 
when he's going around workhouses in Ulster in 1846, 7 and 8, he's insisting on uh, separating the uh, prostitutes from the other women. So he's setting them up in a separate uh, section within the workhouse. Not So the workhouse is being extended in the midst of the out, outbreaks of fever, typhus fever, lapsin fever, etc. And yet he's focused on the fact that these women uh, should be separate from the, um, the other inmates of the workhouse. I'm just interested in the, the point on the Catholic Church and the amount that was uh, could have been given towards famine relief instead of setting up uh, institutions abroad, etc. Um, does Josh may have any sort of a figure? Is there any tentative figure at all as to what the alternative money could have been that would have been uh, used in Ireland if, she, she, if she's pushing that case? I'm just wondering, did she have any, did she come across anything in terms of actual financial statistics? Thank you so much for the question. Um, I did not come uh, to specific numbers, like when it comes to money, like uh, amounts of money that was uh, dedicated, because in the literature that I read, there were general terms like significant amount of money or what could have fed this number of people and so on. So that's why I didn't want to like write anything or say anything that I wasn't 100% certain about. But from the research that I have done, it was significant enough for people to have paid attention to saying that, oh, this could actually feed us. This could have been saving lives instead of spending it on travel expenses, on uh, the clothing as well that was expensive, and to basically keep a certain uh, elitist status for these women who joined the, the church. But to answer your question, I do not have a certain number that I can give you, not at the moment anyway. Yeah, it would just it'd be nice to have that because it could certainly back up your point um, as to, you know, the the a physical amount of was it thousands was it hundreds of thousands etc and just uh, you mentioned at the start about the majority of books being written by men i think it's fair to point out that very few books were written about the subject as you said up until the second centenary in 1995 but up until then the major books had been by women and that was by uh, cecil woodham smith in 1962 mary daly in 1978 which is very much a revisionist uh, effort and then of course christian canadian 1994 and that's what inspired me so and, and numbers of women have written locally on the subject as well so i don't think it's fair to say that Cormac grad is one of the top but he's, he's alongside christine Keneally. uh and of course as i say Seth smith was one of the the pioneers of original research in 1962. Uh, can i ask someone's asked a question do we have any resources about pregnancy and birth during the famine um was record keeping public record keeping when did that really start well 1864 is uh, it becomes compulsory in ireland so it, registration we, of births and marriages 1864. Okay. after that you're you're really looking at church records uh in terms of, of births uh, and catholic church records are very poor because you're still you're just post catholic emancipation 1829 and just to you know uh, bolster what ashmay was saying earlier on about uh, the limitations on catholic life catholic churches were not officially allowed to keep records until after emancipation 1829 so the records are really very very patchy throughout all of the 32 countries you know um Kat, does any another question has come through um and this is for all our guest speakers tonight somebody one of you may have an opinion on this do any of you have opinion as to why cannibalism is researched in relation to famine under stalin but not the great famine which is further in the past now as well i think yeah well i think he if I can proffer an opinion, uh, you know, if you look there, I mean, one of the things that's going on at the minute uh, in Ukraine um, is the, uh, the justification by the Russians that they're fighting the Nazis and, and uh, Putin saying today that it's 80 years ago that they were fighting the Germans and now they're going to have to be facing German tanks again. And the point is made by some people that there were a significant amount, a number of Nazis amongst the Ukrainians in the west of Ukraine in particular. Um, and that, that stemmed to a large extent from uh, what Stalin did during the Holdemore in 1932-33 when millions died. Um, so it, I think it's, it's very, very political in that, you know, if you want to undermine uh, what Stalin did and the Russians right through to today, then you're going to look at that. Uh, I certainly haven't come across uh, any issues of cannibalism. Um, but then again, it depends, you know, they, they're not going to write it in letters uh, to relief agencies, I wouldn't have thought, but I certainly haven't come across, but I have heard that there are references. Sorry, George, your camera has went off on us and maybe your your phone fell over just so you know we can't actually see you at the moment. Um, does um Ashma Ashma, do you have anything to add to that? Or 
You okay? Okay. Um, just there's another comment here as well. Um, what a rant about the Catholic Church and men in general. Um, the real cause of circumstances that led to the famine were, uh, were not dealt with. It suited the British government to blame an act of God for when their penal laws caused it. Um, I think in, if I'm right, in the context of what we're talking about this evening, this evening we're looking at really where circumstances can um, make it a much more difficult situation for women. Um, economic circumstances and I think we just have to look at countries other countries even around the world today where economically um, people are severely challenged um, and the circumstances around them impact um, quite often women and children um, to a greater degree um, well, I think that look at the workhouse sorry Dolores, but if you look at mm -hmm. the, the workhouse admission registers it's very rare to see husband and children deserted by wife you know the vast Completely, yes. will be will be deserted now and they weren't they weren't it wasn't always the case that the husband just cleared off but husbands were going abroad for example uh during harvest to scotland to england trying to earn money to bring back you know so um for food etc so but you do find throughout the workhouse registers thousands of cases of children um or wife and children or mother deserted by a uh, father this doesn't apply simply to the Catholic Church. A lot of this would apply to a number of the churches of the time, you know, oh, more like, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, another question is, were there hiring fairs for girls in Ireland at this time? Can anybody ask that question, answer that question? Hiring fairs were a later time, were a later period, do you know, Jared? I haven't come across them uh, in the 1830s. 40s i haven't come across them um that's not to say they weren't but uh i know they were very common from the 1860s 70s onwards um but i haven't made, i haven't seen specific reference to people being hired out um but i i know i mean dealing with what i spoke about last week the uh, foundling hospital in dublin i mean thousands of children were, were put out the nurse in the country and um, so i'd imagine that a lot of them that end up, ended up working in, in agriculture you know maybe slightly different um, there's another question. The question was: Has the British government compensated Northern Ireland in any way for the mishandling by the for by the former of the latter? Um, no, I think that is getting into a very kind of political space, um, which well, I don't think I, I don't. Like, sorry, yeah, the Northern state didn't exist. Exactly. Um, we're getting to in, and into another political sphere here, um, which uh, just another question. It's just like. Um, this lecture um, was not focused on the cause of the famine, which are dealt with in the first lecture, but the focus um, was it effects on women. Yeah, that's so just someone making a comment, clarifying what we're talking about this evening. Um, thank you very much, Ashme. That was fantastic um, talk this, this evening. Uh, can I just, one final question came in here. Was the exporting of Irish girls to Australia applied to girls in England and Scotland? Does anyone know that? George? I can't confirm more than I. No, I haven't seen that. I've looked through yeah. the record of the English workhouses, which it was a different world over in England in the, in the 18, mid 18 to late 1840s. Uh, no comparison with the Irish workhouses. So I haven't I haven't seen that. Uh, uh, and the, the poor law worked different in Scotland in that you had a local parochial poor law. Um, uh, you didn't have workhouses the way you did in, in Ireland. Uh, certainly not the same. Um, and someone else said here how in some more comments are coming in here that um, the workhouse minute books for some workhouses show that girls could refuse to go to Australia and of course some did and and I suppose some and and, and in some cases I'm sure girls agreed to go to Australia but I suppose they were at a, at a time when they had no concept of really where Australia was either it would probably would have been a case of depending on the management of the workhouse and what correct information was actually been shared with them at the time um and well, that was used as a punishment actually just about you know transport was, seven years transportation to van diemen's land was actually a punishment you know mm -hmm. and they realized if somebody got transported there was little or no chance that they were ever going to come back and you, you could have been transported for you know stealing money stealing cloth the children are in court uh maybe as as ash may made reference to you know somebody stealing sheep uh which was a capital offense actually uh, you know, or seeing the horse certainly was a capital offence, but seven years transportation was seen as quite a harsh uh, punishment. 
you know so that, that, I think that's that speaks volumes and though economically there are benefits of these young girls been sent to Australia um at the end of the day we have to remember as well the pressure on the workhouse system yeah, um, it was uh, there was also a relief mechanism there, wasn't it, to reduce yeah. some pressure. So mm -hmm. we have to, I suppose, recall all the time that there were so many influences going on at a very um, traumatic period economically, and um, we can't just. It is a, a lot of interpretations. Um, and we all have different interpretations of it as well. Uh, I'd like to thank Ashma again for delivering her talk. So, George, yes, I just want to briefly just 